So coming back then to the, the novel itself, I wanted to just speak to the Cape Town setting because yeah. obviously as you spoke about Kailicha there as well, the relationship between Cape Town as a metropolis and the Eastern Cape is very strong and very long standing. Yeah. And in another interview where you speak about the history of a pleasure seeker, you talk about the city and what people can get away with in the city yeah. and how it kind of inspires certain modes of behavior. And I think that's very true of Pete Barol. Yes. Um, but let, let's just have a quick read of the kind of setting that, that begins the novel. So former tutor Pete Parole and singer Stacey Meadows are making a splash in colonial Cape Town. And in the novel, we've got the Mount Nelson, we've got, you know, settings in the city that are very f familiar. Yeah, it opens on Adderley Street. Exactly. So, it's, I mean, it's a great kind of tribute to the city itself. Um, and they style themselves on these aristocrats and then live by their wits before things slowly come to a kind of crunch. And then yeah. they go in search of this amazing tree yeah um, and it, it's been really well received I mean you you um, have heard from the mail on Sunday I'm sure that it's been called one of the outstanding you've been called one of the outstanding writers of your generation and um, and you've been at this for a long time first advance for your book at 18 I was 21 actually okay Peter got younger and younger as the newspapers oh really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well that explains it but I mean how has it been writing this novel and returning to South Africa, which is such a part of your childhood imagination, I suppose, yeah. in comparison with, with some of your other novels? Well, you know, The, the Drowning People, my first book, uh, which is about a 70-year-old man who's just killed his wife, and he tells you, and then he tells you why. And that's all about the upper class English and the strange ways in which they behave. Mm -hmm. I guess because I arrived in England as a kid and I was sort of fascinated by this world that I found. Um, and then I wrote a book called Us, which is about a bunch of kids at Oxford. But then increasingly, I've been very drawn to writing about South Africa. And again, I think that because I didn't grow up here, I don't really belong to a South African tribe. Mm -hmm. I can go hang with the whites in Camps Bay. I can hang with my buddies in Langa. I can go to the Eastern Cape. I, so I get this sort of access to South African you have society, an immunity as an which outsider. I feel really grateful yeah. for. And you know, I sound very English, but I actually am only South African, only have a South African passport. Um, and as I said, I think for the storyteller, it's very rich. And of course, in 1913, 14, and when this book opens, there was no Google, no internet. Mm. So if you made it from Europe, you could get off the boat and pretend and to be whoever be you wanted. Yes. And people would believe you. Yeah. And that happened, you know, again and again and again. And it still happens. I mean, just, you know, doing a bit of prep for this interview, I thought about Jürgen Haxen, who was a German who came to South Africa, right. set himself up in the kind of leafy streets of Constantia, yeah. in a beautiful mansion, and proceeded to swindle people. So there's really? an element of, of what's in your novel still in Cape Town today. Yeah. Not great, you know, but it's there. Yeah, it is. And I think Cape Town is a, is a fascinating city. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very full of the past if you know where to look. You know, there are these wonderful colonial buildings. And in fact, Jan van Riebeck was told to dig a trench to separate the colony from the rest of the continent. I mean, apartheid right there from the beginning. Oh. And he didn't dig a trench. He planted a yew hedge. And two of those trees are still alive. Golly. One is in the company gardens, one's in Kirsten Bosch. These trees that have seen the whole history of the country of South Africa. Mm. I want to ask about, about some of the response you've had. You've spoken of, of the response of South African journalists and reviewers. And I have to say, when I first encountered the novel, I just thought, oh boy, the, the great colonial lens on South African history and, you know, the kind of British imagination of, of what happened here in the early, you know, kind of 1900s and so on. And as I read in the book, you know, it complicated that judgment that I had just reading the brief. Yeah. But how has the response been from local readers, also readers, local reviewers, as opposed to kind of the British press, which might, you know, it might feed into ideas about... Yeah. You know, South Africa from British history. I mean, the South African perspective is very important to me. Um, and I've been really touched. In fact, I was interviewed by the Sunday Times the other day uh, by Jennifer Platt. And what she said about the book actually made me cry. I mean, not sob, but I felt tearful because I threw so much of my life <clears throat> into telling a truthful story, into not telling the colonial <clears throat> sort of idea of what South Africa's history was, but to try and build <clears throat> three very different South Africans and give them all their weight. And so, you know, Kabisa Zola, what he thinks of the book, what Africa Milani on Cape Talk thought, yes. that's, and they liked it, and they thought that I'd done a good job yes. creating nuanced, constant characters, and that was very moving for me, because I really tried. Yeah. And, you know, I'm totally broke as a result. <laughs> I'm still paying off this huge loan. Oh, no. It's okay, you know, I'll make money in the end, but, but there's something real happening yes. in the Eastern Cape, and people are 
you know, alive and their animals have, have water. So there is something that you've written about in terms of your writing and what's important when you approach a text and, a, and, and the whole procedure of putting it together. And you said that straightforwardness and honesty are essential to good fiction. I and think so. And that, that period of, of doing the research and being in Butterworth and building relationships with people to, to be able to be honest in rendering also characters, for instance, yeah. um, speaks to that. But also humor. <sighs> There's a there's a wry tone to to elements of your writing. People say that. <laughs> I think I see the funny sides in human life, you yeah. know. And there's there's humour all around us, and sometimes it's dark humour. Yes. Um, and uh, sometimes it's lighter. But I try I try to write books that kind of take you into a world that make you think. I just want to sit down all day and read yeah. and be there. Uh, they don't sledgehammer you with their mm. politics or their history. All that stuff should just be part of the entertainment because in the end you want to entertain. And I think if people are entertained, it can help them then imagine what it's like to be people who aren't them. Yes. You're not lecturing them, you're entertaining them, telling them what I hope is a really gripping story. And then at the end they're like, oh, mm. you know, maybe that gardener over there comes from a fascinating tradition mm. and an interesting life. And maybe I should find out what his life is like. 